more. I'm going to share my screen to show the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, please leave them to the last part of the presentation. You can ask them um, by typing, uh, as you can see on the right side of the uh, presentation. And now I'm going to share my screen. OK. So starting this uh, presentation is also brought to you by MindLift in cooperation with BrainBoost a successful neurofeedback clinic in Germany um, that helps uh, patients, professionals, athletes, musicians uh, improve cognitive abilities using uh, the power of uh, neurofeedback. The uh, webinar is the first uh, in a series of webinars that we're going to host. Um, and it's brought to you by MindLift Academy. Now, MindLift Academy um, is a new initiative launched by MindLift, um, a company that provides uh, neurofeedback products. And uh, we basically let successful clinicians share their experience in the field um, and teach um, about the fundamentals of neurofeedback. Um, and in some other webinars, it's going to be about more advanced neurofeedback. Um, in other webinars, it's going to be about marketing and expanding your uh, neurofeedback practice. Uh, this program will also give access to uh, qualification courses in uh, neurofeedback. So for example, you want to you know, you add uh, neurofeedback to your practice, uh, but um, you don't want to go through the, uh, or no one around you offers neurofeedback qualification. So you can do it remotely through the MindLift Academy. Uh, we also provide one-on-one -on -one clinical oriented and business growth consultations. and uh, as I said before, workshops on neurofeedback marketing and general uh, neurofeedback info. Uh, now I'll pass the stage to, uh, to Philip, um, who's going to speak to you about uh, neurofeedback today. Huh. OK, so hello, everybody. Um, so I guess I will share my screen now, or Asis, will you stay with your screen? I think you're uh, now you're live. Now I think your your screen is what's shown. Okay, one second. Okay, so now it should work out. So hello, everybody. Um, my name is Philip. I will introduce myself in a second. But uh, yeah, the main topic today is neurofeedback, uh, fundamentals of neurofeedback. So I will give you um, some insights on the general idea of neurofeedback, then how we apply it uh, in our clinic, and then also some, some examples of, of cases. Um, so um, yeah, let's get started with me. I'm myself, I'm a medical doctor. I didn't go quite the typical way a medical doctor usually goes in Germany. So right after I finished uh, med school, um, I settled down with my own medical center focused on neurofeedback and also found, founded the company BrainBoost Neurofeedback, um, which is focused on improving the technology of neurofeedback, but also um, yeah, getting, getting new business cases developed and also like building up partnerships with MindLift to bring innovation to the field of neurofeedback. So this means, our company is split up into two bigger parts. We have a medical center that is focusing on treatment of patients with medical conditions with neurofeedback. So all we do is neurofeedback because we want to do it extra good. So um, we do diagnostics with EEG and we do treatment with neurofeedback. And with BrainBoost, we address non-medical clients. So this means people who say, for example, I don't sleep so well, but it's not quite a medical condition. So um, I wouldn't consider myself a patient, but I would still like to improve my sleep. But this also counts for athletes, artists, managers, everybody pretty much who has a, a cognitively challenging job. But we also do, like today, teachings, trainings, presentations, sp speeches, talks. Uh, we do supervisions for people who are trying to um, get more experience with neurofeedback and need some some feedback about their own patients or clients. 
And we also do development, for example, for neurofeedback games or software, and also work together closely with MindLift on that. We do have a, a broad team um, with a different background. So the second guy actually is my brother. I founded the company together with him. And he's a sports scientist and also a master in business. So uh, he helps us, especially also um, figuring out how we can track data, how we can measure data, how we can create studies and like improve the treatment we're doing here every day. Um, we also have psychologists here. We have health scientists. Um, we have developers. And also um, on the bottom right, we have a professional orchestra musician who helped us to develop neurofeedback specifically designed for professional musicians who try to reduce well stage fever but also try to handle the very challenging job of being a professional musician so um the agenda for today i think the presentation will be roughly 60 minutes we will first talk about EEG and what the difference between EEG and QEEG or quantitative EEG is. Then we will talk about neurofeedback, how it works, what kind of different techniques of neurofeedback are out there. And then we will talk about uh, the clinical use with some cases, a pick two cases, uh, which I think show some, well, realistic um, um, treatment progress. Uh, and so we will talk about that. All right, I also put like the slide numbers on the bottom right. So if at the end of the seminar you have like specific questions, you can write down the number of the slide that will make it easier to figure out what you're talking about. So we will get started. EEG, the EEG that means electroencephalography in German. Um, that means we're measuring the brain activity. So we are not measuring how the brain looks like. This would be like a CT scan or an MRI, but we're actually looking at what the brain is doing. And the only other thing that could do that would be a functional MRI. So this is a very expensive, very loud, and um, very big device. So usually for neurofeedback, but also like for a, for a quick measurement of the brain activity, we pick the EEG, which actually measures the electric signals that the brain cells emit when they communicate with each other, to put it simple. So when the brain is working, millions, hundreds of millions of brain cells are talking to each other and like um, integrating information and generating feelings, reactions, movement. Everything we do and feel is generated by the brain by sending different electric impulses between the brain cells. And this generates an electric field which we can measure on the skin of the of the skull we actually don't have to put needles into the brain anymore which is uh, nice for most people so we can put on a cap with some um, electrodes and this will show us the brain activity in um, in certain frequencies so as you can see in the back for example these would be e typical eeg patterns you can see there so when you're looking at an eeg curve you can like it's looking at a at a vinyl vinyl where you have a music and all the music is compressed into one line that will contain all the information about the music that will be played once you put it in your player it's similar with the eeg so in this in those lines you will see all the information about the brain's activity from this very electrode is combined and condensed and so when we use algorithms to extract certain frequency bands. This means that all these frequency bands are happening at the same time. We're just looking at different speeds of activity and then figure out how much does this specific frequency band contribute to the total electric uh, amplitude. I often compare this to looking at a city where you have a lot of cars going around and then you ask how many cars are going 20 miles an hour, how many cars are going 30 miles an hour, how many 40, 50 and so on. So this is basically what you will see here. Put this tool here. So you will see that there is one frequency band that says, OK, now I'm only looking at the activity that is from 1 to 4 hertz. The next one is I'm looking at the activity from 4 to 8 hertz. The next one is a little bit faster. For those who don't know it, hertz means 
like um, the frequency per second. So this means the brain cell changes its polarity eight to 12 times per second, which is, well, I guess quite fast, but for human being, this is like medium fast. And then you can see that this range ends somewhere around 40 Hertz. So the human brain, the brain cells in the human brain usually work somewhere between one Hertz and 40 Hertz. And again, all this is happening at the same time. You have like, millions of hundreds of millions of brain cells and they are um, distributed in a certain spectrum uh, around these speeds and frequency bands. So for example, when we try to fall asleep or better even fall asleep, a lot of brain cells should be going one to four Hertz. So then we should have like a big electric peak here at Delta and not so much electric activity in the faster frequencies. Otherwise, it will be hard for us to sleep well. When we are relaxed, then we should have a lot of brain cells going somewhere in the speed of alpha. So to make this easier, so you don't always have to say 8 to 12 hertz or 12 to 15 hertz, um, there were Greek letters or like uh, Greek names picked for these frequency bands. And in case you're wondering why alpha is somewhere in the middle, this was actually because alpha activity was over 100 years ago, the first activity that really stuck out of the, the EEG signal. So back then you could only have a look at the, the EEG lines. And um, when people closed their eyes, one could see that, especially in the back of the head, there was mm, around 10 Hertz rhythm very clearly coming out of the, the original EEG lines. So this is when people thought, hey, let's, let's call this alpha, it looks nice. This is supposed to be alpha, everything else, let's call it beta. Everything that's faster than alpha, we will call it beta. And then later on, people found out that, okay, there is actually like, we should make this um, in smaller frequency bands because low beta has a different feeling to it, a different function than for example, high beta. So this is why then the beta band was divided in different um, frequency bands. And later on, the slower activities were also added. So this is why these uh, Greek letters are a little bit mixed up. So when we talk about those frequency bands, people often say Delta is responsible for sleep, Theta is when you're deep, deeply relaxed or tired, um, Alpha is regularly relaxed, Low Beta is, well, let's say a state of awareness that is still somewhat relaxed. Um, beta activity shows up when you're getting more focused, High beta activity is really focused or even stressed activity. And gamma is still, I call it magic because this is like responsible for a lot of the things that we haven't, like we didn't understand um, so well until now. So for example, it shows up for uh, at um, uh, monks that have done a lot of meditation. It also shows up when you're uh, dreaming a lot. It's probably also associated with uh, learning, uh, pro uh, processes. So um, this is a very important activity, but it's not so easy to be measured because it doesn't have a lot of uh, amplitude. It's usually going, um, it's usually a very fine activity. So when you, when, when we talk about those states or feelings here, we usually mean when the brain has a lot of this activity, then we feel relaxed or then we feel tired and so on. So if you have someone who has a well-regulated brain, then usually when he uh, wants to concentrate, the brain shifts into more beta and high beta activity. When he sits down and wants to relax, the brain shifts into more alpha or more theta activity. Now that's how it should be. So this is basically what you can see in the EEG. And when we say, for example, someone has a lot of alpha activity, it means a lot of brain cells are going in alpha speed for this person. So obviously you will probably not know all these activities by heart, but to make this very simple, I put this arrow down here. So generally it goes from slow to fast and this is also what they relate to. Slower activities make you tired, it's harder for you to think straight or to do cognitive tasks. Fast activities make it easier, but at some point you get very stressed and very um, agitated. So summary about the EEG, it shows the brain activity. That means what the brain is doing. It's actually a very easy, cheap, and painless technique. I and mean, you can sit in the lounge chair, put on a cap, and we can see what your brain is doing. 
much easier than using an MRI scan. We have a high resolution in time. That means we see what the brain is doing immediately. It's only a few milliseconds later that the electric activity changes and it shows up on a computer. So when a person is getting tired and falls asleep or is, is like almost falling asleep, we probably know it before he actually feels it and realizes that he's getting tired. We do have a low resolution in location. So that means since this electric activity of, uh, of the brain cells needs to go through the skull bone, through the skin, into an electrode and so on, we can, we can see where it origins on the neocortex, which is the part of the brain that is very close to the skull. But for example, deeper brain structures, we will not have enough resolution to actually track the signals back down to deeper brain structures. So with the EEG, we can, see what the part of the brain is doing that is very close to the skull. Luckily, this is the part of the human brain that is responsible for like higher cognitive functions, like speech, recognizing faces, saving information to memory, feelings, like visionary inputs, stuff like that. So I would say for, for research, it's nice to have MRI, which can go much deeper into the brain, but for what we are doing, EEG is perfectly fine. So also interesting is some medical conditions will only show up in EEG. And what I usually use as an example is a mild concussion or like a medium concussion. So there was a, a movie and also like some discussion about um, NFL players having concussions and then later on, especially big, big cognitive problems due to several concussions during their career. And so after a light concussion, you will not see that there is a, a bleeding in the brain or a bigger damage. And also after some days, the player might be fine. is not feeling dizzy anymore or falling down when he tries to run off the field. But you can still see in the EEG that the brain is still a little bit shook and not working well anymore. So this would be something that you can actually see in the EEG, but probably not in any other uh, type of uh, medical diagnostics. So this was EEG, let's look at quantitative EEG, which is sometimes also, uh, also called brain mapping. Because as I explained to you, all those lines and alpha, beta, gamma, whatever, this is a lot of information and it's not very visual. You only have those lines going across the screen. It's hard to actually see what's going on. So typical neurologic diagnostics with the EEG is looking at the EEG lines. If they look really bad, then people might have epilepsy or a tumor or bigger problems. But everything else is not easily visible with just looking at those lines. So the idea of quantitative EEG is to take the EEG data and actually compare it to a database. So this means it will give you a statistical analysis of how often are which activities showing up in the brain of the person I'm looking at? Does he have more alpha activity than I would expect, which means is, is there more often cells switching to alpha activity than usual? Is there more beta, more, more theta, whatever. So this will give us something that looks similar like this. This is now also, you can see why we call it brain mapping because it looks like a map from your brain. Let me start on the, the right-hand side first. So we do this usually with a 19-channel recording. This means you have 19 electrodes on your head. And this gives you um, sufficient grid. And I see those little dots are the electrodes on the head. This is supposed to be the nose, the left ear, the right ear. So you're looking down onto the head. So this gives you a grid that, that gives you an OK resolution to see what the brain is doing. Um, there is, uh, for research, EEG that uses more channels, up to 128 channels. But this doesn't really give you more information, at least not for what we are doing. So we usually use a 19-channel recording. And then we have a comparison to databases. There are a few databases out there that are typically used for purposes like this. Um, the one we use is called QEEG Pro consists of about 4,000 data sets, 
which are distributed between, I think, about one year old and 80 years old. So you have different databases for kids and other ones for, for adults. Um, and well, it was recorded in um, um, several uh, medical centers, mainly in, in Northern America. So this shows you then a comparison to what I usually, I use to, or I, I try to avoid words like normal or healthy or stuff like that. I usually put it, we are looking at how is the EEG different from values we would expect on average from a certain person. So for example, if there is a 20 year old male, what kind of EEG activity would I, would I expect from someone that age and that sex? So this gives you a statistical analysis of brain behavior. And this means when I look at this, this down here, this shows you how far off of the database the activity is. So for example, everything that is colored white, and when you look at this head, it says theta. So this shows you the theta power, the theta amplitude, and it's fairly white. This means that this person's theta activity is quite there where we would expect it on average. So it's, it's neither high nor low. Everything that is colored more red shows you that this activity is more present than we would expect it on average. Everything that is really blue shows you that this activity is less present than we would expect it on average. And you know, just objectively looking at that, this means that this person has a lot of fast activities. Remember, beta and high beta are rather fast activities. So this person, this, this person's brain is doing a lot of fast activity and not so much slow and relaxed activity. So for example, alpha is colored blue. This means not a lot of alpha activity going on here, but there's a lot of fast activity going on here. So this brain has a tendency in this situation where we did the recording, we usually use five minutes or so out of it. So during the recording, this brain was more active than we usually expect from someone that age. And it's important for me to put it out careful like that. It doesn't mean that this brain is broken or does something wrong. Maybe this person was doing very hard math tasks or something like that and was stressed by that. But if I told this person, you know what, try to just sit, relax, don't think of anything special, and let's just record your brain's activity and see what it's doing when we just leave it alone, and this activity shows up, then this means the brain is very active, although it should be more relaxed. And this can help me to actually support or even just find a diagnose for this person. So this could be, for example, someone who has or is suffering from chronic stress and sleeping problems. Now he has a lot of fast activities, not so much alpha. This is often a, something that shows up when someone comes with uh, sleeping problems. However, I don't like just looking at the QEEG. I always talk to the client or the patient and hear him out. But if he mentions symptoms like, for example, sleeping problems, and I see this quantitative EEG, then I can tell him, yeah, you know what? Your brain kind of looks the same way. Your, what your brain looks like fits what you were just telling me. And this is interesting for me because then I know, okay, makes sense. This could be someone who could benefit from neurofeedback. But also it's often helpful for the clients or the patients because they see, okay, there's actually something going on. There's a reason why I can't sleep. I can actually measure that. So this is why this brain mapping usually helps to identify possible problems and also helps you to find the right training protocol. Now, a brain mapping is something where you will need a big EEG M4, which is also quite expensive and takes some knowledge to, um, to use. But if you look at this closely, then you can see that those patterns, they would also show up in a similar way if I, for example, only measured one electrode in the middle. I would still see that there's a lot of beta activity, and I would still see that there is not so much alpha and theta activity. So this gives you a hint of what could be the problem, but often it's, you don't even need a 19 channel recording for that. So I know a lot of people, and it includes myself, who started out with not having a 19 channel system, but 
just keep in mind how this would look like, okay? So I would see the same information or very similar information if I just measured, for example, this very central position here, which still give me the same hint of what's going on. Here is one quick example where you can see that this actually, the brain can actually change the state. Here we have the same, the same thing. Um, we have a uh, same person in both, like both um, brain mappings. Here he is just sitting there with his eyes closed, not doing any, anything specific. We see a lot of theta activity shows up, some alpha activity shows up. And then he does some active meditation. So he is actually trying to get himself into a meditative state. And you can see that within a few minutes, the brain's activity is actually changing a lot. So he is not so much theta anymore. It's not as red, not so much alpha. But he has, for example, more gamma. Here he has, is only blue. And here he's like getting more towards what is here closer to average. And you also see some changes in this area. So I, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but this is, I think, a nice example where you can see that this really shows you what the brain is doing. And when someone is trying to change his state of mind with meditation or just relaxing or something else, then you can actually see this with EEG and with quantitative EEG. So quick summary. The quantitative EEG shows you the brain activity compared to a database. So this is not the absolute values anymore. It's all compared to a database. It shows a deviation to expected values. So it shows you this is higher than we usually expected. This is lower. We use it to find the best training protocol and an individual training protocol. But again, often, it's like it is, it is a lot of information that we cannot even fit into a training protocol. So even though we do use the brain mapping, we often end up with very similar training protocols because similar problems with your clients or patients show up very similarly in the brain mapping. You can use it to track the progress of training. I usually don't like to do that that much. And also we don't have to because a lot of the time our patients or our clients they tell us that they feel the difference. They see that something goes on. They see that their clinical symptoms are improving. So usually we try to avoid getting that before and after shot just to, I don't know, rub it into the client's face that we did something good. He usually knows that we did. So, but you can still do it. And for, for um, I'll show you some cases later where we actually did it. So it can be quite interesting. And again, some medical conditions will only show up in QEG. It's the same like in EEG. Okay, so I hope um, this was understandable for, for most of you. Um, this was the part about the EEG. We would now continue with what is neurofeedback. Yeah? Because after we found a way how we can, uh, where we can actually show what the brain is doing, um, um, we will, we will um, see how we can train the brain, okay? So this is basically uh, neurofeedback as it looks like. So you have a person who is uh, sitting there trying to work his brain. You have some way to show him the feedback. And then on the right-hand side, you have a panel where you can actually set up the training. So to, uh, to summarize neurofeedback, I would say it is an evidence-based brain training that improves the self-regulation of unconscious processes without using medication. And this uh, contains a lot of information that I think is very interesting when you try to explain your feedback to someone or also try to understand how to apply it. So it's evidence-based. There's a lot of studies out there that it works and we also see that it works every day. It's a brain training. That means it needs some repetition. It needs someone who tries to achieve a certain state again and again and again. It's not about understanding something and then being able to reproduce it. It's really about training your brain. And it will improve unconscious processes in the brain, which also means that you will not in the, in the first, uh, first sessions be able to link everything directly to something, to a feeling. So I, I always tell people, it will not be that whenever you think of flowers, then I don't know, your activity, your alpha activity will go up or something like that. 
So this is a, um, a quick drawing of how neurofeedback works. We are constantly recording brain activity of the person training their brains. Then we send it to a screen that uses the EEG signal and extracts, for example, frequency bands like alpha, theta, beta. And then there is usually a training protocol that, for example, suggests certain conditions for each of these activity. So for example, there is uh, alpha activity and we say, okay, whenever the alpha activity goes up, I want to show this as a positive feedback to the person. Whenever it's going down, I want to show this as a negative feedback to the person. So this decides pretty much for which activities the brain will get a reward and for which ones the brain will not get a reward. And so this then is usually transported to some kind of feedback that the person um, intuitively understands. So we actually do like a lot working with movies. So you watch a movie, when your brain is doing the right activity, you will have, you will clearly see the movie and just can watch it. And when your brain is doing something we don't want the brain to do, then the movie will turn black or get smaller and the, the volume will be turned down, something like that. So your brain intuitively understands, oh, I can't see the movie anymore. Um, I did something I shouldn't be doing. Or on the other hand, if it, the movie pops back up when the brain is doing something else, the brain will say, oh, OK, great. Now I can see the movie again. I will try to keep this state up and going. You can also use games that show you, for example, like a positive feedback in the game. The rocket ship, or like the spaceship is flying up. And when you're doing the brain is doing something wrong, the spaceship is flying down. Or you can just listen to music and it will vary in volume. So anything that people easily understand and learn from it and try to influence it, but usually this doesn't work out at the beginning. So usually um, they need to first kind of understand how does it feel when my alpha activity goes up? How does it feel uh, when uh, beta activity is going up and so on? But there's different kinds of feedback and I think it's quite interesting which feedback you, you use. Some people connect way easier with movies. Others, they get too competitive in games. Um, some people like to close their eyes and listen to music. So this is a very important uh, thing of neurofeedback, I think. We already went over this, but this is where you see how neurofeedback is done. Well, like training person, feedback screen, training protocol. And you can see the same in the mind lift um, system. So you will have the EEG amp that measures the brain's activity. You will have a feedback screen, which is a tablet here. And the training protocol will be set up uh, in an online dashboard by the trainee. So, um, and then we'll transport the information about the training to the tablet. So this is basically exactly the setup you will need for neurofeedback. I wanna just quickly go about uh, or over a few different forms of neurofeedback, or as I would say, more correct is the, the data analysis is the main part where we will find the difference. So this, this part is usually where the magic is happening because basically the movie could be influenced by any EEG activity. You just have to pick the right one. So the training person will just be watching the movie, but you will actually decide which, like, uh, which signals will decide whether he will see the movie or whether he can't see the movie. So this is where the main difference is happening. And I would say there's like three different popular forms of neurofeedback. One is the one I was mainly talking about, which is amplitude or frequency band training. This is targeting individual frequency bands like alpha, beta, theta, and trying to influence them. Then there is Z-score training, which is database training. Here you will always have a, the QEEG database running in the background. And then uh, the feedback will be depending on the deviation from the database. And then there is slow fr frequency training. I have to admit that I don't do a lot of slow frequency training. So I am not an expert in slow frequency training at all. So um, the amplitude training usually uses one to three channels. We usually pick two to four amplitudes. So we usually don't use all the amplitudes that are out there, but only specific ones. And usually we have a, reward for certain amplitudes that we want the brain to, sh to show more. So for example, alpha, and we have an inhibit for amplitudes that we want the brain to show less. So for example, high beta. The Z-score training was designed to target many channels and also many values at the same time. Um, so for example, here you have a, 
Um, for four channels, you usually have like 300 values, but for 19 channels, you can have 5,000 values. So this measures on all the 19 channels, all the amplitude, all the relative power, all the coherences, a lot of values. And then basically the feedback is decided, um, um, the feedback is decided whether on how close you are actually um, to the average values, or if your your values are moving away from this from this uh, average value. So I want to point out that like we do not do a lot of z score training, and I but I also don't think that it's just getting the brain more normal or something like that. It is more differentiated, but it might sound at the beginning that it's always rewarded when it is more normal. So it's not like that. It's more about the regulation process. But we have the feedback that a lot of people don't uh, don't really can really connect to it because it uses so many values that they can't figure out how can I actually control this uh, more consciously. And um, the slow frequency training, yeah, again, I said I'm, I'm not an expert for it, but it is a form of neurofeedback training. In Germany, it's actually way more popular. So if I'm right, sorry, please don't don't kill me if I say something wrong, but it usually uses, uh, for example, two active channels that usually compares um, certain signals between those, those two channels and picks especially the very slow frequencies underneath delta and doesn't have really a, like a targeted approach. Like we don't usually work with uh, alpha or theta amplitudes or stuff like that. But again, with the slow frequencies, there is different protocols out there. I was working with ISF by Mark Smith, but there's also ILF by, by Otmar. So there's different forms out there too. Our, the, or the reason why we use amplitude training here at Brain Boost, and also this is what the MindLift system does actually, is there is a high number of scientific studies that show that amplitude training is working for certain medical conditions just well. Um, so, you know, in Germany, the, the laws for doctors are quite strict. So I'm always happy when I can say, you know what, we're doing this training because here's a study that shows that it was efficient on a certain group of people. It allows you to do specific and individually targeted training protocols. So for example, when I have a patient that tends to be very nervous, can't fall asleep, and I see, okay, he has a lot of high beta, not so much alpha activity, I can train exactly that. And that means also that the trainees usually can quickly understand the training since they figure out, ah, oh, okay, when I try to relax, it works better. Or when I try to focus, it works a little bit better. And this can help people to easily connect to that. The progress can be tracked. I mean, yeah, you can see that, for example, amplitudes are not as high anymore or other ones are getting higher. So this is actually something that you can show your patient. And it makes sense. You know, when you explain something to your patient like this or they ask you, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? I think it just makes sense to say, OK, you need more alpha because your brain needs to relax more, for example. I mean, this is why, why we use the training. There is certainly uh, also arguments for the other trainings, but just show, showing out why we are doing this, this form of training. So uh, real quick, we uh, work with neurofeedback with medical patients. We have uh, people from companies that have very hard jobs and usually push themselves too hard as well. Uh, we have athletes. They, um, with athletes, you have, first of all, like being prepared for a game or something and then getting ready in your mind. But we also have that is just a, a very hard uh, job to do. They often travel a lot. They have to wait for games. They have to relax after games. They get injured. So they need to be mentally strong and stable. We've also started working with students, which doesn't only include students with ADHD or problems, but rather just students who, have, who study law or medicine. So they have a lot to work on. Their life balance is going downhill a lot. So we try to keep them stable as well and deal better with the stress. And also artists and creatives, they, um, they usually benefit from learning to let go, fall into a relaxed flow state where they can be creative and find new ideas or, for example, really get into playing their music and stuff like that. So um, you have a wide field of, of targeting um, groups with neurofeedback. And I think it makes a lot of sense to actually maybe focus on one or two of them. We have the best success with focusing on medical patients, but now also the other areas are growing. So uh, a lot of different um, options here. 
Okay, this was a brief overview of our neurofeedback and uh, possible target groups. I think Aziz will now tell you something about doing neurofeedback with the MindLift system. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Philip, for passing the mic. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me. Now you can. All right. Um, just going to do this real, uh, really quick. Uh, some of you might not be familiar with uh, what is the uh, MindLift product exactly. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen again um, and tell you a little bit about it. OK, so Philip has, uh, has given a really good explanation about the fundamentals of neurofeedback, and he's going to continue uh, more details um, after I uh, finish talking about uh, MindLift for two seconds. Um, and he presented um, how uh, neurofeedback is administered um, in the clinic, uh, but also touched on how it can be administered in, uh, at home. Um, and when it comes to um, neurofeedback, you know, asking the patients to come to the clinic um, 20 or 40 times a year or uh, throughout the uh, therapy period can be sometimes hectic. Um, and that's why we have uh, created the MindLift system that allows you to offer therapist guided. Uh, home uh, neurofeedback um, that is easy to set up and cost effective. Now, this type of neurofeedback is also a single channel amplitude training. Um, and I'm just going to show you a short video of how it looks exactly. So we'll start with the clinical dashboard um, in which you can see the sessions that your patients are running in real time. So here you can see that there's a, a wearable headset that they put on the head. This basically is the EEG that senses the brain activity. Uh, it's connected to mobile games, so they can install the app on any mobile device and just play the games, while you can actually track their brain activity and see it in real time, um, and not necessarily being side by side next to the clinician, uh, sorry, to the patient. The patient can be at his home and you can be in your clinic and still see what's going on. You can obviously customize the protocol for the patient. So it's not just a black box that we're giving, but rather a customizable system that allows you to choose the exact protocols based on what the patient needs. So here we can see how you can do it in a very, very, very easy to use interface. Um, it's all based on the web, uh, so you can use it from anywhere. Uh, don't necessarily have to download the software or anything. You know, as the patient is going through the training program, you can monitor the progress of the patient uh, using a uh, few indicators that we added to the dashboard. You can see exactly what sessions they've done, how many rounds they've completed, and how they're uh, making progress over time. You can see their brain waves, you can download it, and you can, you can do whatever you want. Uh, it's a totally open system um, and allows you to customize it, um, and you can use it from anywhere, anytime. Now, the, also the beautiful thing about it is that it's not only limited to mobile games. You can either choose games that you like or, or might not like. If you don't like the games, you can actually choose a uh, YouTube videos, and we're going to see it in a little bit. Uh, so you can actually see videos on the tablet, and the brightness of the screen will be the feedback um, that is received during that video. And these videos uh, can come from YouTube. They don't necessarily have to be on the device, meaning that if your patients doesn't like the games, they can just see YouTube videos and enjoy their time while they're training. Um, okay, I need to switch another slide. For some reason, this is not happening. Okay, so some of you might be asking yourself, uh, how do I get started with the MindLift system? Now, we know that um, we've looked at who has attended the webinar, and some of you are actually already using MindLift or already customers of MindLift. Some of you, have uh, some background in neurofeedback, and some of you um, don't have background in neurofeedback. And that's why, as part of the MindLift Academy program, uh, we would like to basically open the opportunity for anyone who would like to learn about neurofeedback that has a clinical practice um, to join qualification courses that we're going to be providing through Brain Boost uh, or Philip. Um, so if you're a neurofeedback practitioner and want to get started with MindLift, uh, please schedule a one on one demo with us via our website, www.mindlift.com. If you're not a neurofeedback practitioner, uh, please reply to the email that you're going to get from us um, after the webinar, and we will set you up 
uh, to get a mind of system and get a, a proper qualification before you start using it because it's very important to understand the basics of neurofeedback before administering this with your patients. Now, for the dear MindLift customers who are uh, attending this uh, webinar, we will send you a link to schedule one-on-one -on -one business growth sessions with uh, leading clinicians just like Philip if you would like to learn more about how to, to better market home neurofeedback and um, how to grow your business using home neurofeedback. Philip has done it really, really well with MindLift. Um, and in Germany right now, he administers a lot of home neurofeedback sessions per week. Um, and I think he has uh, something to share with you uh, that could be beneficial. I'm going to pass the uh, stage or the mic again uh, to Philip. Okay, thank you. Sure. <clears throat> so, okay. Now let's look into some neurofeedback case studies. I picked two which I think are, um, well, interesting and somewhat representative. So here we have the case number one, um, ADD or ADHD. So we have a female, 13 years old, ninth grade. And um, the main problems are very classic. We have concentration, attention problems at school, but also at home, emotionally and physically agitated, not well balanced, uh, quickly stressed, quickly frustrated, and problems organizing the daily life. Forgets stuff, shows up late, or freaks out a lot, um, doesn't keep the things organized. So diagnosis was ADHD. So we usually get people here when they have been uh, diagnosed somewhere else with questionnaires and tests. But most people don't do a QEEG. So we did a QEEG recording, and we actually saw that this is uh, quite typical. We do have some different forms of ADD, ADHD in the in the EEG, actually. And this also links to a little bit different symptoms. But you know, I don't want to take this too far. But what we see here, actually, is that we have a lot of beta activity. So the brain is quite active, a lot of gamma activity in this summary the high beta activity is actually left out which is i don't know doesn't make really sense but is also very red so we have a lot of fast activities but also we have a lot of slow activities like alpha and also even here some theta activity showing up more than than usual so this tells us two things that generally the brain is overactive we have a lot of fast activity but at the same time we have somewhat slow activity so this means the brain here is actually doing both things, which is a hint for a problem in regulation. The brain is going too fast and it's going too slow and going too fast again. And this is quite important because these are, in our experience, the people that benefit the most from neurofeedback because the brain is actually doing a lot of right things, but then also a lot of extreme and also some wrong things. So this means this brain is already going up and down a lot in activity and this means it will usually easily react to neurofeedback because there's a lot of movement going on and neurofeedback can be used to direct this movement into a certain direction so we said okay the qeg suggests to inhibit high beta and stabilize uh, by rewarding low beta so a typical smr training you can also see that again when you don't have the QEEG, if you just put the electrode on CZ and measure the stuff, you will still get an image that is very close to what we are seeing here. Uh, so um, we usually, or we started the training on the location CZ. We start usually in clinic, which means the patients come here for a few sessions. We usually like the patients to come here for a few sessions because then we can do some coaching tell them, hey, relax, don't stress yourself too much, and also just watch the training a little bit. I mean, this can be done with a regular EEG amp, but it can also be done with a mind lift system because this also offers you live training sessions. So you can hook it up. You can hook, hook up the tablet uh, to, a, to a screen with an adapter or like a, a Google Chromecast, and then you can present the feedback on a screen just in a, like, like a regular EEG amp with a computer. So um, this means... It doesn't really depend on the system, but it's rather about we want to have the patient close for a little bit. Uh, we usually tell people they should come twice a week at the beginning. 
and we usually do 40 minute sessions. Uh, so we started with a protocol that rewards SMR, so uh, low beta frequency, and we inhibit theta and high beta. And we do this on CZ, very standard training, as I already mentioned. And so we did use those 15 sessions in clinic and 25 sessions mind lift means this is where the people actually take the system home with them and they keep it and we advise them to do two or three sessions. We usually do them a little bit shorter, so 25 minutes, especially with kids, we have the feeling that, well, after having this, uh, this thing on and the tablet holding it in front of your nose for 40 minutes, this is quite exhausting. So we have a, a better effect with 25 minute sessions and so we we have kind of an overlap here. So we had them here in house or in clinic for fifteen se uh, for five sessions, and then we gave them the system. They came here once a week, and then two times or every every other week, and uh, still continue the training with the mind lift system. And so also I I said sometimes you don't see a huge difference in QEEG. Also you do see it in uh, in clinical terms. In this case, actually we did see a big difference in, in the QEEG. So this is uh, the patient before um, beginning of treatment, and this is after four months, which adds up to 20 hours of neurofeedback. So not 20 sessions, actually 20 hours, because the mind lift trainings were usually shorter. So you can actually see that there is a lot of improvement in the beta and gamma uh, activity going on. Also, the alpha is more regulated. It's rather uh, a little frontal spot here. Um, but in general, this looks a little bit more balanced. Uh, also, this uh, right um, right frontal tendency here is more symmetric here, which shows you that there is like um, this brain is more more symmetrically regulated, which is usually a sign that um, it is um, I don't know, it, it's getting it's getting there basically. So after four months, we did see some improvement in the QEEG and also on the clinical side, you know, this is the after uh, QEG. Also on the clinical side, we did see that there is an improvement in concentration. We did the attention network test, which basically tests how fast you can react to certain stimuli. We saw an improvement there before it was, um, then it was close to average. And we saw an improvement in school grades after four months. This is something to be expected. Uh, we saw more emotionally and physically balanced through the uh, neurofeedback sessions and also didn't get angry when the game was not working or something like that and was not as quickly stressed and frustrated and also better organized in daily life. So this was actually something that I would consider realistic for ADD, ADHD. 20 hours of training spread out over, as you could see, like 40 sessions varying between 25 and 40 minutes per session, two to three sessions per week and uh, four months uh, um, total time should at least show you if the neurofeedback is working on your patient or not. And especially with a lot of better activity, it seems like the brain is easier, slowing down a little bit, so it usually works quite well on that. And um, this should also be improvements that you would see. So the school grades, I mean, obviously they will not always go up, but this is a good indicator, especially for kids. And we would expect like one or two nice grades by then. And the parents come in and tell us, oh, oh, he had like a, an A in math. He never had that. So um, this, this is what we would expect. Otherwise we would say, hey, we need a plan B or, um, or this neurofeedback is not working. Usually it works fine. And then this is also a point where we say, hey, should we continue? Should we make a break? It's also up to you. It's stressing you out a lot. These patients say, uh, or the patient wanted to continue. So now we will specifically target this frontal alpha here and see if we can still get a little bit more improvement on the emotional stability with that. So this is one typical case. You also see ADD cases where you have a lot of theta activity instead of beta activity, but it, it works quite similar. If I go back here, this is the beautiful thing about SMR training. You target the lower frequencies and you also target the higher frequency and uh, try to kind of merge them on this SMR basic rhythm. So this usually works out well in, in, in both cases. We are always more than happy to share later on some more clinical cases with you. We actually have like everything you can imagine from epilepsy, neuroborreliosis, 
a lot of things. So, and we also we always do QEG recordings. So we also have some some interesting data for you about that for supervision, for example. So, case number two to round this up from my side, uh, we have a male, 34 years old, works in sales and uh, has depression with rumination, a lot of thinking, especially in the evenings, also anxiety due to rumination, negative thoughts, problems enjoying leisure activities. Yeah, nothing is really fun anymore and diagnosed with depressive episode. Looking at the QEG, I mean, this is now a different way to display it. So it goes in like single hertz bins here from one to 20. So if you remember correctly, then theta activity is somewhere here, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the frontal alpha is here, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So this would be a typical, typical depression with the frontal alpha activity, but also has a lot of theta activity, which shows you that it's really, yeah, it's really, really tired and fatigue as well. And yeah, so a domination of slow activities with a tendency to the frontal lobe. So... The QEG suggests to inhibit theta and frontal alpha, and we usually stabilize with low beta activity. So we started with the protocol number one on the location FC. We picked this location because we could clearly identify it in the QEG. We usually don't go more to the front than the F, F um, positions because we have a lot of artifacts in the frontal positions. So usually most trainings we do are in this square of the F positions, the C positions, and the P positions, because there we usually don't have a lot of artifacts and get nice signals in there. So we said, okay, let's reward SMR and let's inhibit theta. And also we added on eight through 12 Hertz to inhibit as well. So we can target theta and alpha. Now this might, re might require to, uh, to have a QEG to specifically target that. But on the other hand, targeting frontal alpha for depression is also kind of a standard amplitude protocol. So we started this out and we did some sessions in clinic with that. And then we said, hey, you know what? We should maybe also try to um, get him more relaxed. He's still very anxious, feels like he's always under tension, doesn't sleep well. So maybe it would be also good to work on the parietal lobe. So we did also create this training protocol for the parietal lobe where we reward alpha activity to get this um, asymmetry between the frontal and the parietal area of the brain uh, more normal again or more equally balanced uh, and inhibit the theta activity because this was very dominant in the parietal um, area and this can lead to the feeling of fatigue. So we said, hey, how about this? We do in clinic, we do sessions of the protocol number two but we give the person a mind lift system to take home and keep doing the protocol number one. So he doesn't need to show up four times a week in our clinic, but we can do the new training protocol in clinic and see if it works out well for him because we're there when we do it, but he can still continue the training that's her that has worked well for the first 10 sessions so far at home with the mind lift system. So this is something we really like as also with ADD that we Keep the people continue with the training we started here, switch to a new one, which we can do under supervision, but they don't lose like the effect of the, of the first training they did. And so here we also have uh, actually a nice effect. Obviously we could not reduce all the theta activity at once. I mean, this is not realistic to completely change the brain uh, that quickly. This is also after four months and 23 hours of neurofeedback, but you can actually see how this parietal training protocol help this person to reduce the, the theta activity. It's actually gone down a lot. And also this alpha asymmetry is starting to normalize a little bit more. So from the QEEG, it looks quite successful. And um, the main results of the training are improvement uh, in depression. We did this with an interview with a scoring system, improvement in, in sleep. I mean, this person was waiting two to three hours to fall asleep. Now it's in under one hour, which is already an improvement for him emotionally more balanced, not as much anxiety, and we could even start to reduce the medication by 50%, which was quite easy though, because he was taking actually a lot of medication. So, um, but we could step-by-step uh, step reduce the medication. And 
stabilize the brain in what they're doing. And now we will continue with the PZ alpha training. So we'll probably switch the mind lift system to that as well, as well so that he will get more and more alpha training uh, to continue with that. So I would say this is also like a typical case for depression, linked though with a lot of tether activity, which is often when you have someone who's really feeling tired, can't get off the, out of bed and so on. So quick summary about what I told you. Apparently some of you already know a lot of the stuff when you're using MindLift already. I hope it was still a little bit interesting. So we went about the EEG basics, talked about the frequency bands, talked about how databases are used, uh, talked about advantages disadvantages of the EEG. We talked about neurofeedback, the basic idea, how to use it in practice with a, a conventional EEG amp, but also with MindLift system, which has the, the advantage that it's, uh, it's, it's cheaper to get and you can give it to your patients so they can take it home and continue their training at home. So we actually, at this moment, we have around 45 sets rented out to our patients, um, which is great, I think. I, I, um, I'm always happy, you know, when I like on a Sunday morning, I see the emails coming in that people start their trainings. And I know, you know, if it wasn't for this portable system, then those people would not be doing your feedback right now. So I really enjoy that. Uh, we also talked about uh, the target groups of neurofeedback. This is also something we can give you some insights about in a personal uh, meeting. And then we looked at some case studies, the, the symptoms and the progress tracking by QEG, but again, also to us more important, the clinical tracking of of what's going on. I mean, it's not worth anything if I tell the patient you, you should feel 10% better because your theta activity is 10% um, uh, lower. Um, this is also why I really appreciate that MindLift now offers the symptom tracking, which is really valuable. If you like people call you, it's like, hey, how am I doing? And you can look at the values of the training, but also at the clinical symptoms. This really gives you like uh, uh, both important uh, parameters about, about your patient. So I think this was uh, the webinar from my side. I think Assis will say a few more words uh, about what's what's next, and then we can target some questions. You can just put them in the in the chat uh, window, and then um, we we will try to answer them for you. Awesome. All right, I think everyone can see me now. I hope so. Um, okay. So um, thank you so much, Philip. That was amazing. Um, if you, um, if I heard correct, correctly, Philip, um, you mentioned that you were using 45 home systems um, by MindLift. Uh, so basically, you have 45, more than 45 patients who use neurofeedback at home right now. That's amazing. Um, and so let's just summarize it by saying, what's next, right? So you've learned about neurofeedback. Uh, you've learned about the fundamentals, obviously. Um, some of you might want to get more in depth. Um, so that's why um, we will um, um, offer you the ability to get one-on-one -on -one consultations with uh, Philip uh, through the MindLift Academy. Uh, but if you're already a neurofeedback practitioner and you would like to get started with the MindLift system, please go to our website and schedule a one-on-one -on -one demo. Uh, we will show you that around the system and we will tell you exactly how to start. By the way, if, you're, uh, if you have uh, neurofeedback knowledge and would like to get more uh, business growth consultation or more advanced uh, neurofeedback info, then please uh, also let us know and um, we will get you uh, started with Philip. Um, am I screen sharing? Okay, now I'm gonna start screen sharing. All right, so you can see, you can see my screen right now. Um, yeah, this is, I, I thought I was screen sharing, but it turns out I wasn't, um, so yes. Please, want to get started, if you're a neurofeedback practitioner, schedule a demo. If you'd like one-on-one uh, -on -one business consultations, let us know, reply to the emails that we're going to send you. If you're not um, a neurofeedback practitioner and would like to add neurofeedback to your practice, um, first of all, reply to our emails, let us know that you would like a MindLift system, uh, get the MindLift system. When you get the MindLift system, you will get a complimentary um, a remote neurofeedback qualification session by BrainBoost aka Philip, um, and then um, after you've done the qualification session by Philip or by BrainBoost, um, then you'll have access to the system completely, start you know, training with it um, or start using it with uh, patients. And as you're doing that, you're going to get one-on-one uh, -on -one professional consultation sessions or 
one-on-one uh, -on -one support from Philip uh, to make sure that you're supervised correctly and that um, you're managing your patients in terms of neurofeedback feedback uh, in the proper way. Um, and now we can um, open it uh, for questions and answers. Okay, so um, Philip, I see that the uh, the questions here are more on the clinical side. So uh, if you could just uh, answer them. Yes, sure. So first question is best protocol resource uh, you would recommend. Um, when I understand this correctly, it means that um, it's a, it's a database that links um, symptoms and protocols. Um, together or tells you when you have this symptom, you should uh, use this protocol. So I think this is a, a little bit complicated. There is different services that actually offer this already. We use uh, the QEG online database, which can link uh, protocols to certain, um, to certain um, symptoms of QEG findings. But um, I also like to consider just a lot of studies. So I usually look into papers that actually show you, hey, we did this protocol with this group and um, emphasize this or that, and then we, we got this result. So I there is a lot of good studies out there. Um, you can find them by just like Googling it and finding the papers. So I like to go there and, and see what has been done and how has it worked out and how did they do it. So, um, but again, we are also working together with MindLift to build up a more uh, a knowledge base that actually helps you to link this more quickly. But um, yeah, it's, it's uh, a little bit difficult. However, there is uh, a few protocols that usually work just well. So we work a lot with SMR training. We work a lot with alpha training and we do work a lot with this frontal alpha down training because there's also been a lot of studies uh, to that. So I hope this is okay as an answer. I don't have this one website where I can tell you, hey, you will find everything there you need. No. Um, oh, quite a few more questions came up. So are there age, oh, uh, age and activity related norms that we can use when monitoring and positively negatively reinforcing the client. So the, for the typical frequency band and amplitude training, you don't have this um, databases to work with. So you usually work with just the amplitude of the person. There is a, for everything else, you would be needing um, Z-score training. So Z-score databases, they actually do cost a lot of money though. and at this moment, they are, for example, implemented in the Brain Master systems or the Mind Media system, so you can use them with that. But in the MindLift system at this moment, there is no database to control actually like where you're training with the, with the person. However, we work a lot with our databases and um, it works just fine because we rely on those classic amplitude trainings that actually have been established before there even were databases to be used. So if you actually want a database to check that you're not doing anything extremely wrong, then you would have to get a live Z-score databases, but they are much more expensive and um, can be implemented though in the regular EGM. So you can have this running at the same time. Can destroy your amplitude training a little bit though, because the idea of amplitude training is to actually give the brain a very specific information about what you wanted to try out. And then you figure out, is this working out fine or not? If you don't do anything really crazy, then usually there's not something bad happening after a few sessions. And also other norms to diagnose ADD, ADD, ADHD, and other disorders in adults and kids. Um, so there is, um, yeah, I mean, there is some, some typical pictures that you will find in the QEG, but there's also something you can do without databases, which is actually picking ratios of, um, of different activities. So, one thing that is very common to diagnose ADD, ADHD is comparing the theta amplitude to the beta amplitude. So the theta beta ratio, if you have more than two times or 2.5 times the amplitude in theta than you do have in beta, then it's very likely to have, um, to have attention problems, concentration issues, focus issues, and so on. So this is something also that has been out there. And again, we are working on building up an easy to understand knowledge base for that. So you can actually have a, a quick access to that. 
Um, but again, you will also find uh, some some information about this in in certain studies. But yeah, it's it's not that easy. That you know, I'm always trying to think of solutions that are actually applicable for people who might not have very expensive 19 channel um, um, EEG amp and a medical background. But I think um, we'll be coming up with something very soon that will actually help you to to at least get a tendency of the person in there. Uh, but this could also be something, you know, if we if you have like schedule an hour or something like that, we can I can show you some examples and also give you some some ratios. But I, at this moment, I don't have like a list I could just send you. Sorry, we're working on it. Okay, how long is the sustained effect of neurofeedback? So I usually tell people there is one advantage of the way neurofeedback works and that it works kind of like slow compared to using medicine. So uh, usually when you use uh, medication, this can work quite fast. If you give a, a um, ADD kid Ritalin and it works fine, then the problem is gone in, in one or two days. Um, but neurofeedback takes some time. The brain actually needs to discover the by itself, how can I achieve this state? How can I do that? And since this is actually a learning process, this is also a, a long-term effect that usually is sustainable and uh, will not go away by itself. Um, this is also because we usually show the brain a more effective state of working. So this is not like, it's not a natural way that the brain would actually leave this more effective state and go back to something that makes life harder. Usually the brain will get the reward to keep the state going every day because things just work more easily. It doesn't make you resistant to anything that happens. So if you treat your body bad and you don't sleep enough or you have a, a job that is very stressful, then those effects might also like the brain might be conditioned again into a a bad way but it's not an effect that usually just goes away after some time because you're actually training the brain to keep this effect going and so usually it's a long-term effect there's actually also studies that show that it, it, it lasts over 15 years so this is what we're talking about um, for peak performance do you also do a QEG analysis in order to decide the training protocol Yes, we usually do a QEEG, but um, if you go a little bit deeper in the QEEG, this also shows you the relative power. So for peak performance, we usually uh, use the relative power to just get a tendency of how the, how the brain is balanced, how the brain is working out. But we see the QEEG rather like uh, one snapshot of the beginning. So the most things we learn is while the person is doing the training. So, and since there is no databases for uh, except for relaxed states, because everybody reacts somewhat differently, we um, we usually take this as a like beginning picture, but then we usually work out with the patient uh, what training we will do and how we will proceed. So this is why it's very interesting for us to monitor the training and also use different feedback options. So what happens if we like uh, put the orchestra musician in front of a video that actually shows him uh, the opera or something that he will once failed in and is uh, since then is very stressed out when he has to play it. So this will show up in the regular training and then we can see that we work with that. So usually we pick the QEG to get this first like glance at the patient's brain, but then we develop the protocols symptom based and also like modify them quickly. So if we have someone where we think, oh, this guy could use SMR training to reduce his high beta and we see, okay, he did it in, in the first 10 minutes, then we will not continue with it and find a new protocol to work with. And again, here we stick usually with the, the classic protocols like SMR, alpha training, alpha theta training. Are there any risks associated with use? Yeah, um, so, this is a question that is, um, is a little bit tricky. Actually, I, I often like use this for like, what are immediate side effects or risks and what are long-term side effects or risks. So immediate risks, there's usually not a lot. So people can get a headache, people can get a little bit tired when they stare at the screen trying to fly a rocket up with their brain. So this is something, but usually there's nothing immediate. I mean, what a lot of people are afraid of is seizures or people with epilepsy that they might get seizures. Um, actually, neurofeedback was developed to treat epilepsy and seizures. So usually this um, also works out fine. I think it's important to explain to people that this could happen. And also when you have 
like very hard medical cases and you're not a medical professional, then you should not be treating them. In Germany, you're not allowed to do so, but I don't know how it is in, in other countries. So usually when you stick with people who are not suicidal or um, have several panic attacks a day, then usually there's no immediate risks. The long-term risks, I mean, you could screw up someone's brain, but this is why I say usually stick with the, the protocols that actually um, have studies to them that have been shown to, to work efficiently and usually not damage anything, even when not done a QEG before. Um, and also the brain will not accept everything. So for example, if I tell you, okay, now uh, from now on you walk backwards all day long, then at the end of the day, you will still say, you know what, this was fun, but I would start walking the normal way again. So the brain will not just do anything. And the patient will also tell you, you know what, I feel like, uh, I, I really get dizzy or I, I need to get really tired for the rocket to fly up. So you will figure out, okay, this is, uh, this is something that um, um, is probably the wrong thing. Uh, we will also uh, put together some things or we can uh, talk about some things that usually work fine. Right? There are some trainings that can be a little bit tricky, but usually you should check with your patients if they have seizures, panic attacks, depression, anxiety, everything that can come up or crawl up quickly or even migraine, they could they could start having a migraine because the neurofeedback can be quite exhausting. So uh, you should check for a few symptoms like that. Uh, but usually no side effects, no risks if you stick to uh, the plan, basically. So for any real clinical liability, we would need a full cap based uh, system and then use my lift as just a home training tool for patients. Yeah, I mean, this is actually uh, a question. So the question is, do I need a, a full brain assessment all the time? I mean, I showed it to you because I um, actually, you know, we had the data and I think it makes it more visual. But, and, and we usually do the, this uh, protocol here uh, for uh, this, this QEG here for um, most patients just because we can. Um, we usually also don't charge a lot extra for it because we just want to collect that data. But we have actually developed a system that um, uses uh, four channels, or actually three channels to screen, which is FC, C3, uh, CZ, sorry, and PZ. And um, we just do a few minutes of recording on these channels and then we use those ratios uh, that I've talked about before and analyze the entire thing and also the clinical symptoms can be very interesting as well. Uh, as well. Also, this is something that we are working on to, to implement, to give you some guidelines, like with what symptoms will I not be needing um, uh, a clinical QEEG. So for example, with ADD or um, ADHD, also with chronic stress, sleeping problems, you usually don't need a quantitative EEG. Like usually you will find exactly what you expected the patient to have. But also, to be honest, you know, if you have someone with a complicated depression and you want to treat his brain, that is probably a good idea to get some more knowledge uh, about that. But this is the way we use uh, we use MindLift here because this is our main center. But the new centers we started, we we started out with just the MindLift system, and it it also worked fine. So you can, if you pre-select the people you will treat, you can actually do a lot of treatment without having the clinical recording. It will help you, though, to um, gain some more knowledge about what's going on in the brain, to be honest. But I think it's possible for certain cases and certain training protocols to actually do it without the QEG because while doing the training, you will get some data and you will see what's going on in the brain of the patient. So this is actually possible. Like most of the data we will get from just the regular training that is running and not from re recording QEGs all the time. SMR rocks. I agree, it's awesome. And um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Joe Luber, you can look into that. Like the pioneers of neurofeedback did a lot of um, amplitude training. So I, I also found a lot of knowledge there, also some really interesting protocols. And like even looking at the QEG, we usually end up with like one of five choices of protocol. We usually don't do crazy stuff. We do stuff that people can easily connect to and that will exactly target what we want to target. So usually it's five training protocols we pick from, even with QEG recording and everything. We might be a little bit strict with that, but it works fine for us. 
Uh, yeah, I'm reading the chat, sorry. But there's a question too. Um, youth professional, okay. So this is rather uh, a question for, so, sorry, I skipped, I didn't read it out loud. The, the question is about the qualification to use the product. So the, the mind of system, but maybe a C scan later, get back to that question. Um, it's, it always depends on your country. So the Muse itself is not a medical product. So um, I don't know if you, if you need a medical license to do this or not. I mean, this is something you would have to figure out um, uh, in the country where you live in and where you practice, um, uh, or uh, where you practice in. Uh, and also uh, like in, in Germany, for example, it's the question, am I coaching someone or am I treating someone? Um, so, um, sorry, this is something maybe I just can say a few words later on to that. I would just go over a few more questions and then um, we will see. Ah, okay. The one channel mini QEEG systems. Okay, so uh, we we usually um, we use actually the we use our use our brain master systems at this moment uh, to record um, those single channels, and then we just we have like a scale of the ratio, and then we like find a rating from uh, from one to five stars and figure out does he have a lot of beta uh, alpha theta and so on. This is something I'm more than happy to explain to you in detail, but this can be done with MindLift system as well. And I talked to Assis and I think there, there will be some progress in there too, that this will actually become like an automatic process where you will just like close to the Swingle protocol. Maybe this is also something you can look into. Um, this is uh, also using individual channel recordings for a certain time and then you analyze um, ratios between certain frequencies. And there you can gain a lot of information. Uh, just how is the frontal situation? Is there a lot of alpha when eyes closed? Is there a lot of theta when eyes closed? How's the central situation? Is there a lot of high beta, a lot of theta going on? How's the parietal situation? Is there uh, alpha activity? And when people close their eyes, is the alpha activity actually going up? This will already give you a lot of information about the patient. Um, um, any recommendation for motor ticks? Ticks is something that is really tough, I think. Um, I, we have worked with patients with motor tics and we had good success with SMR um, using, you know, calming down the motor cortex, but often this is also linked to um, um, anxiety or also a lot of stress. So I would try something that is relaxing like SMR or even alpha training. This can work out, but this is, for example, one indication where I actually tell my patients, you know, we can try it and maybe it helps, but I could not like pull out a paper and tell you, hey, it worked, it has worked on 20, 20 people and so let's do it. So this is something where I'm really careful and we had like mixed success. One very good with another was like actually a 14 year old kid. Um, also was adopted from Russia. So I don't know if there was a lot of trauma in the like childhood growing up. So, but it, it didn't really work well on him. And we did 25 sessions or so. Sorry. So I did seven months of neurofeedback training 10 years ago. I uh, helped, but after seven months. The... Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. You want to say something? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I'm just answering uh, Lisa, uh, who asked uh, what are the qualifications to. Uh, to administer the uh, MindLift system. Um, we, we work with mental health providers um, and uh, sports uh, uh, clinicians and uh, coaches. Um, if you don't, if you're not going to use this with uh, clients then, or if you're going to only use it for yourself, um, then unfortunately we do not um, have this option uh, yet. Um, and um, I would say, like adding to what Philip uh, mentioned about the uh, mini QEG. Um, so we are in the process of designing a mini QEG system as well that you can use with your patients um, to uh, understand uh, what brain waves uh, should be improved. Um, and, but this is going to be released probably later on this year. 
Um, in the meanwhile, um, for people who do not own a QEEG system, uh, as Philip mentioned, they can stick with the known protocols based on a checklist of symptoms, um, and that should work uh, based on the existing literature. Um, now, just going back to the um, uh, therapist, or the, the reason why we don't uh, sell to individuals um, is because we believe that um, a neurofeedback should be therapist guided. Therefore, if at some point in the future, we will release this to um, anyone to just download it or use it at home, it will not be without any therapist, uh, sorry, it will be, it will not be without therapist supervision. It will be mandatory to have therapist supervision. Um, but right now, uh, we still don't have that option for consumers to use it for their own. So I'm sorry, Lisa. Uh, but maybe in the future, and when you decide to use it uh, by yourself on your own, you'll be connected to a therapist with a neurofeedback qualification to administer your training remotely. But under no circumstances, we can set it to be administered individually. Um, okay, I guess we don't have... Uh, I see that Michelle is typing, so I'm going to just wait for Michelle's uh, question. Um, and probably Michelle is going to ask something about... Which doesn't ask a question, but rather is asking Lisa. Okay, if we have no further questions, then uh, I would like to thank you all. If you have questions for us, proceed from there. Again, thank you so much for joining. This was a um, good um, uh, presentation by Philip about the fundamentals of neurofeedback. I hope it was informative. Um, thank you so much, Philip. Um, for taking the time to do it. And again, thank you everyone for attending. Cheers. Bye-bye.